news. We're going on an African bone hunt. That means thousands of miles of blistering sun and sand. Did I say good news? One, two, three, four. Grandpa studied dino bones. Sam and Allie loved just what he did. Oh, they really dug his work. Hunting on the internet for all the dino stories they could get. About dinosaur digs, which scientists think they're piecing it together. Bonehead, detectives of the paleo world. Bonehead, detectives of the paleo world. Finally. Sorry, Allie. You do remember we're doing a show here? Yes, I know. Uh, hey, everyone. Where were you, Sam? Sorry, I had to run by my friend Zach's house to pick up this shovel. It took me so long to find it because his garage is such a mess. But now I'm here and ready to dig. Uh, Sam, we're not actually going on the dig. We're just watching here from the studio. I know that. I'm using it as a visual aid. <sighs> Alrighty then, let's get digging. Today, we're going to follow famous paleontologist Paul Serino and his crew on a fossil hunt in the Sahara Desert. I can dig it, as my dad would say. But what I'm really stoked about is that we get to follow this case from beginning to end. That's right. We'll see how real bonehead detectives crack a case. And we'll answer the key question. What goes into a successful dig? Well, you need a good shovel. Right, but what about a good team that sticks together? Looking for bones in the world's biggest sandbox can be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, but not as frustrating as trying to find this shovel in Zach's garage. You know, if I hadn't have tripped over his dad's saxophone case, I would never have found this thing. Well, that's exactly like bone hunting, Sam. What? Tripping over somebody's saxophone case? No, some of the most amazing scientific discoveries depend on dumb luck. You'll see. Ah, uh, not so fast, late boy. She who was on time shall press play. <laughs> oh, right, the beach. Not quite, Sam. This is the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. It's the biggest desert in the world. The Sahara is three million square miles of the harshest sandscape on Earth. Plus, not a lot of fossils have been found here, so most boneheads stay away. Because the African continent is still so unexplored, its mysteries have been irresistible to boneheads throughout history. In 1914, German paleontologists found evidence of a creature they called Spinosaurus. Unfortunately, these fossils were destroyed in a bombing raid in World War II. A few years later, French bonehead René Lavocat hopped aboard a camel and hoofed it through the sands of Morocco, where he found further evidence of dinosaurs in Africa. Then, in 1990, American paleo detective Paul Serino came to the Sahara and made a huge discovery. So huge, it made headlines. He found an entirely new kind of dinosaur. He named it Afro-Venator, meaning African hunter. Here's a picture of it chopping Paul's head, too. And now that old rebel Paul is returning to the desert. I've always been a, a rebel without a cause as a kid. I found a cause now that causes um, unearthing uh, really whole new chapters of uh, dinosaur life in Africa. So Paul put together his team in Chicago for the biggest bone hunting expedition ever to go to Africa. They flew to England, where he got these cool land rovers. Then they drove through France and Spain. It's not exactly a short drive to Africa. And it was going to be an even longer stay, about two months. So Paul had to make sure he had the right people for the job. Not only did they need experience, but they had to be able to work well together. And they had to know how to party together, too. To a reasonably complete sauropod with a skull. But not too heavy, with no ribs. <laughs> we have um, Gabriel Lyon, or Gabe. They call me Myasaurus, which means good mother. And so if I need to discipline them, it's not a problem. <laughs> then we have Hans Larsen, variously known as, uh, what? Solo. Solo. <laughs> Solo, who is a paleontologist. He also uh, is handling the vehicles and uh, lots of other things and, and, and is very interested in, 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 in helping describe and find the dinosaur. Didier Dutay, French paleontologist, generally goes by the title of ambassador because uh, he, uh, he manages all complicated affairs. 
Jeff Wilson, who is our sauropod, the big dinosaur expert, who would love probably more than anyone else for us to find one of these huge, huge beasts. Did we already touch that? Let's touch it. <laughs> Why not? Sauropods. Isn't that a good... Now that's what I call a serious paleo party. Well, they better live it up because once they get to the desert, there won't be any of life's luxuries. Yeah, and there might not even be any fossils. You're right. I mean, even though they think the bones are there, there's no guarantee. And even if they are there, finding them won't be easy. Yeah, but Paul has a hunch they will, and he's willing to bet his paleo reputation on it. I hope he's right. Don't fly away. The gaggle will be right back. <laughs> Do your own cartoon with Real Tunes, You Do the Tunes. Go to discoverykids.com, click on Real Tunes, You Do the Tunes, and you can make your own cartoon. That's right, this cartoon you get to do. It's Real Tunes, You Do the Tunes, only at discoverykids.com. On Discovery Kids. We're back on the road to Morocco and full of hope. It took 11 more days for Serena's team to finally cross into Africa. Their first stop is the Moroccan port city of Tangiers. Well, I guess there's no turning back now. Next stop is the medieval city of Fez. As you can see, they got an early start on the day. And they're not the only ones. Those are the sounds of Muslims at their morning prayers. That's a sound you probably won't hear in Chicago. And here's something you won't see. Check out what a Moroccan mall looks like. All prices are negotiable, but if you want a bargain, you've got to speak French. Monsieur, combien pour litre? Uh, pour kilo. Kilo. kilo? No, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had gums eight, nine. Yeah. <laughs> it's the price. Ça, c'est le prix. Excusez-moi, how much do you charge for the giant pile de cinéma? So it's 15 per kilo. That's not bad. With all the supplies packed up, the team headed for the desert. Africa has always been the least explored part of the world when it comes to fossil hunting. With the blazing hot sun beating down on endless stretches of sand, most boneheads have stayed away, but Sereno and his team love a challenge. Not to mention a good mystery, and the Sahara is pretty much the mystery capital of the world. Let's see what the sands of time reveal today. Sounds like it's time for one of your snazzy timelines. One timeline coming up extra snazz. This is the time period Paul's into. It's called Mesozoic. That's when the dinosaurs ruled supreme. But the part of the Mesozoic that really rattles his bones is the Cretaceous. Why? Because that's when the African dinos started coming on strong. And that's because they were cut off from their relatives in the rest of the world. Why is that, you ask? Because for the first 100 million years or so of the dinosaur era, all the continents in the world were blobbed together into one big mega blob called Pangaea. Then, about 150 million years ago, the mega blobs started to split apart into a number of mini blobs. Some boneheads think the dinos started evolving differently in different parts of the world. And so we have the idea that uh, possibly on different islands, continents, uh, a whole different kinds of animals came into being. It looks like at least the predators and possibly the herbivores had gone off on their own. And uh, how different and bizarre these animals are is what we're really trying to narrow down. How did the isolation at a continent level affect dinosaur evolution? We think something different was happening here. To try to prove his theory, Paul first takes his team south to Anwal. That's a small Moroccan town at the edge of the Sahara Desert. Because some fossils were discovered near here about 40 years ago, Paul has high hopes for what might be buried in this part of the world. This is the most ambitious expedition ever mounted in this area, and the whole town's talking about it. After checking into Hotel Pup Tent, it's time to dig. Climb this ridge, you see a really long sort of tongue coming down. So maybe that's this ridge here? Yeah, that's probably that. OK. With Han's directions to guide them, the search is on. More and more, there's evidence that uh, there are fossils here in Morocco. We know that there are fossils here. But actually, getting there with the right team with the right amount of energy and the ability to cover large areas uh, of this part of the Sahara is the grand trick. Now Paul has a pretty good track record when it comes to bone hunting, but he'll still have his work cut out for him on this dig. Hey, you found something already. Looks like prospecting for fossils is a piece of cake. I think that prospecting for fossils is um, a lot of hard work. You can uh, 
uh, look here in the fossils there and you don't see it, that part's luck. Yeah. But that you're looking in this area in the first place has to do with the fact that you've interpreted a map correctly, that you've gone to the outcrop, saw a bad one, went to a good one. You make hundreds of decisions like this in the course of a field season. And mm -hmm. if you have some idea of what the rocks are telling you about the environment, then you, you stand choose. a much better chance of mm -hmm. finding fossils. It's like it has more to do with um, understanding rocks. <laughs> and what do the rocks tell you? Nothing, if you keep hitting them on the head like that. Well, that's the only way to find out if they're hiding any fossils. One of the fastest ways to tell what kind of sediment you're dealing with is just to taste it and chew it for a while. Because with just one or two bites, you can determine how much grit is in a piece of sediment. It's a little gritty, but much very, very, very slight. Just a touch, touch of sediment. Yeah. Snacking on dirt told Hans and Paul two things. Number one, that this area used to be a saltwater lake, which means very few dino fossils will be found. And number two? Dirt tastes better with a little salt. So after seven days in Anwa with nothing to show for all their work but a mouthful of dirt, they packed up the trucks and headed even further south to a region called the Kem Kem. Now this is real desert. Very few people live out here, and guess why? It can get as hot as 130 degrees and no air conditioning. There's a, a certain aura about the Sahara uh, because there's so little known. And a vastness uh, that you get when you enter the Sahara, which you don't get anywhere else in the world. Um, it's awe-inspiring when you're in the field and you realize how much of this land has never been walked before. What about those footprints right there? That's just a mirage, Sam. The desert can play tricks on your mind. Whoa, you're freaking me out. But Paul dreams of finding the real thing, fossil evidence of how African dinosaurs lived and died in the mysterious Mesozoic. It looks like Paul and his friends are in a hurry to find out. They've got the pedal to the metal. And they're going to put the hammer down. 10-4. And the dig continues. Let's get back to the desert. Sam, I'm sorry, but I cannot take you seriously with that fake mustache. Fake? What makes you think this is fake? Because, I'll show you. That's what a real mustache looks like. All right, you got me. But I was just paying tribute to my man, Paul Serino. Well, your man and his team are starting to look a little bit tired. Can you blame them? So far, the more they search, the less they find. That's got my man Paul pretty bummed out. There's such a lore about this part of the Sahara with the early finds. I thought that bone might be more plentiful. It would be easier to find fossils than it actually was. And uh, after about two weeks of being in the desert, we understood the odds we were against, which was that it was going to be quite difficult to actually walk out of here with uh, some new dinosaurs. Things are starting to look pretty bleak. But while there's still time, this crew isn't about to give up. So night after night, they go back to their campsite empty-handed. Pretty harsh. But they don't lose hope. Out in the desert, it's all about positive attitude. And it can pay off big time. In fact, the next morning, Gabe turned a potential fashion nightmare into the find of a lifetime. Well, in the morning, it started out on a wrong foot, literally. Uh, one of my boots had been plunged into water, and so we opened up the truck, and it was time to go prospecting. And I decided to prospect in one boot and one sandal and had spent the day with a little bit of trepidation on every rock. It came time to go back for lunch, and I said to Jeff, I said, oh, I'll meet you at the truck, so I'm going to go the long way around. It's easier to get down. Gabrielle uh, all of a sudden uh, didn't come back for lunch on time, and we got very worried. On the way, I stumbled over a, an incredible find. <laughs> At the time, I didn't, I didn't know it. And uh, we went running out to find, uh, find her after uh, almost an hour had passed. I saw one bone, I saw another bone, and I was trying to get them, and I knew I was going to be late for lunch. And we eventually did find her, and she came down with these strange bones. And they were running around calling my name, going, Gabe, and I'm like, I'm fine, I'm, I'm OK. Everyone was pumped. Finally, some serious bones. And they started uncovering Gabe's lucky discovery right away. After five days of careful digging, they finally uncovered all of the bones. But now, before they could move them, they had to pack them. This is one of my favorite parts. They get these giant rolls of tin foil and wrap the fossils in it. The world's oldest leftovers. Dinosaur, the other white meat. They've got to make sure that it's really tight, like Jeff is doing here, so that no fragments can be knocked loose. Next, the team wraps the bones in these burlap strips that have been dipped in plaster. When it dries, it's like an outer shell that'll protect them on the long road back to the lab. 
It's like the cast I got when I broke my arm in second grade. Yeah, except that your bone was only eight years old. Hey, a cast is a cast, man. Anyway, with everything wrapped, they loaded up the fossils and headed back to camp. And that's where Paul realized just what they'd found, and it seriously freaked them out. It was midnight of that long, long day that I went into the uh, shelter that we had uh, the bones stored in, and I picked up the first fragment and put it right into place on one of the other pieces. Uh, as the hours passed, my eyes were just really, I, I was, I just couldn't believe what was being assembled in front of me. Four in the morning, Paul came over to my cot and was like, Gabe, Gabe. I was tears in my eyes. I said, you, you don't know what we've discovered. I discovered something absolutely incredible. What? You're never going to believe it. What we were seeing was a map of a single skeleton, a very strange one. I had a very important announcement to the crew. I assembled them all. I started telling them that they were the greatest crew because they'd put up with an uh, incredible uh, season. Not a single one of them was down. And I said, you, you know, I started crying in front of them. And I said, you will not believe what we have begun to discover here. Uh, come and see. What they saw was a whole new kind of predator. It looked like a weird mini version of Scarius Maximus, better known as T-Rex. Nothing like it had ever been found before. Which was more than enough reason to celebrate with some good old fashioned desert football. Hey, I thought these guys were tired. No better way to work up a big appetite. Dinner is served. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of spice. Yeah. 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 Work of magic in the field. But before they turn in, there's one last chore to do. They have to replenish their water supply at the local well. Good move. They'll need it tomorrow when they're back in the scorching hot desert, hoping that their good luck continues. Don't. Discovery Kids Gaggle. Hey mates, it's more Outback Adventures with the Croc Hunter from Down Under, Steve Irwin. It's a whole herd of Croc Files. The Gaggle, next week on Discovery Kids. It's your world. Gaggle it. We now return to the Gaggle on Discovery Kids. Now that they made the big find, they can all go home happy now. Uh, not so fast. They still have a few more days and they're going to make the most of them. Let's check it out. The dig's almost over, and Paul's on the lookout for one last find. We still had uh, a couple days left in the field. We moved to one of the last areas we had to look. This time I was the lucky one, and it was totally unpredictable. I saw an area of outcrop. I walked towards it, and I walked over, and I saw in front of me a pile of bones, fragments. I picked this thing up, looked at the upside down side, and my eyes popped out of my head. Here we had the back end of a theropod skull, beautifully preserved. Flesh-eating carnivorous dinosaur. Of course, always fingers crossed, I mean, maybe this was part of something else that was just above somewhere, but it was quite sheer. And I missed it the first time. And I circled around again, and that's when I saw, I looked up, and I saw on a pillar of rock, the rest of the, the brain case and the skull going into the side of this cliff. And it was a sheer cliff, and it was sort of like a little statue sitting up there. And my, again, this was too much, I mean, <laughs> Wow, this cheekbone is really huge. So this would be the nose area here? Yeah. Yeah. This right, this is the left. So it's been put over there. So here's the other nostril right here. Yeah. I'm digging in the nose right now. <laughs> Look at this. Have you guys seen the teeth? This is incredible. One, two, three. There's a replacing tooth here. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We got the whole jaw. This would have been one mean creature. Jaws. If I ever imagined myself alive with one of the creatures that we're excavating, I always imagine myself hiding, but I'd, I'd give an arm to see the thing alive. It would be absolutely fantastic, um, even if that arm was taken by the dinosaur. <laughs> and there's no doubt this guy could do the job. Grabbing his arm with those teeth, tearing it off, having at him with those claws. Back at the dig site, they plaster up the bones and roll them out of there. OK, I see where it's coming. OK, see if you All can right. slide it. On the count of three. One, two. Easy go. Okay, slide, slide to bottom. Pull yourself up. There we go. Okay. Very good. Woo. That's Got some it. pretty impressive teamwork, but the hardest part is coming up. Okay, now. One, two, three. 
you can't imagine a better team. A team that sticks together, has fun, works incredibly hard with shredded boots, patched pants. They're ready to, to go the extra uh, 10 miles uh, in the heat, and, I, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, a part of it. It's the last day of the dig, and what a way to wrap things up. They found some great clues to the mysteries of the Sahara, but their detective work is only beginning. Yeah, I know what you mean. How are they going to get that thing into the back of that truck? Hey, all right, they did it. I guess it wasn't so tough. Actually, I was talking about getting the fossils back to the lab and trying to figure out just what kind of beast they'd found. <laughs> oh, sure, there's all that lab work, but there's something even more important waiting for them back home. And what would that be? Some real food for a change. Really good, I think, omelet. Hot chicken wings. Yeah. Juicy steak, some corn on the cob. That'll be good. Some mashed potato. Yeah. Definitely steak and milk. That would be my bet. That would be my guess. Chocolate milkshake with whipped cream. Well, believe it or not, it's finally time to head home. They've got a lot of lab work to do, but at least it'll be air conditioned. Looks like they made some friends while they were in Africa. Of course they did. They're not exactly your average tourists, but they did get some of the best souvenirs in history. And even after the fossils themselves are in a museum somewhere, Paul and his rock group will always have the memories of their African tour. It's terribly thrilling to pull off these adventures in Africa. When you meet the challenge with a young group like this and succeed, it's one of those rare moments in life, and life is short. We're going to be back, I hope, next year, uh, trying to do it again. And uh, I think we all leave feeling that it's one of the greatest moments of our lives. Not too shabby, they took on the Sahara and they kicked some serious desert butt. Go ho, boneheads. Teamwork, sweat, and elbow grease. That's the recipe for success. It may not sound too appetizing, but it works. Yeah, and let's not forget that classic one boot, one sandal search strategy. True, sometimes it takes more than skill and a cute mustache to find fossils. No matter how great your team is or how much you prepare, you still need luck on your side. Yeah, like when I tripped and found the shovel. Probably not as important a discovery as Paul's, but I see your point. Yeah, well, it just inspires me a little bit more to go on to my next big dig. <laughs> what, back to Zach's garage? No, I just so happened to find a couple bones in my backyard. Might just poke around a little bit. Uh, Sam, don't you think your dog Curly buried those? Maybe, but uh, we won't know that till we take it back to the lab. Come on, Sam, where's your lab? My laboratory, it's in my basement. It's in your basement? Yes. What? What, the washing machine? Yeah.